All right, here we go. Good to see you, mate. Yeah, no, yeah. good to see you. No, 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 and nice to see you so relaxed in the lead up to the big game. <laughs> Australia week, mate. You've got to be relaxed. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I've had just the opportunity now with um, Argentina to come up against Australia a couple of times. I think four in the last two years. And I'll, I've got to admit, it was full on mixed emotions. For me, I suppose maybe it's, it's sooner than that, that straight transition from 19. Is it the biggest week for you like from a coaching point of view as far as being an Aussie? Um, is, it, is it the big week for you when it comes to Test 40? Oh, I think it's a bit of fun, mate, yeah. isn't it? You know, the contradiction of a Australian coaching England and coaching against your own country. Like, and I always remember that first test back in 2016, we yeah. went to Suncorp. Yeah. And I went in there and I was, I was pretty, you know, I was thinking, I'm, I'm going to enjoy this because this is a good experience. Then I went and sat in the box and this woman who had, you know, all Christian Dior <laughs> just starts yelling abuse at me. I thought, right, well, we're on here. Here we go. This is a bit different now. Well, I, I think that um, that 16 series would have been um, extremely intense for you. Like, I can only imagine it. And obviously, I was at the other end yeah. of it. And we started, I know Australia started yeah. that game yeah. brilliantly. And you made a clutch decision, like, early on in that first test match to take off, I think it was Luther Burrell. Yeah, yeah. Came, uh, and a key decision. And yeah. I think it was one of the, the key ingredients to making a change to the win. But how, like, across that series... How did you your attitude change towards being the former Australian coach who is now coaching England and coaching against Australia as you, you encounter things like that, the crowds, the different types of uh, the sort of interactions with Aussie as, the I suppose, the enemy at that point? It probably became a little bit less emotional about it and just got yeah. on with it. Like the more, as you know, mate, the more you coach a team, the more you love them. Mm. You know, and the more, it's very true. You know, the, these are the players I love. Um, so I want them to do well. And I love to see Australia do well, yeah. mate. You know, I've been pleased how well they've been doing. I've still got my mother watches every game, you know, she watches every game on Stan Sports. So she's a big fan and, and my sisters watch the Wallabies. And yeah. yeah, so they're always, so it's always there, but uh, yeah, I've probably become a little bit less emotional about it. Yeah, with that time, I suppose yeah. that happens, doesn't it? I, I reckon um, that I, I, well, something I really wanted to ask you when they told me we'd be doing this was seeing how you, how your attitude towards England has changed since being beaten by them in the World Cup final of 2003, which would have been heartbreaking, like with, in the circumstances, to now where you're in charge of delivering their success. Yeah, well, it's just the opportunity to, to, to coach at the highest level. Like, yeah, when I left Australia, I didn't. I didn't divorce Australia. Australia divorced me, and you know we've been through it, mate. We yeah. know. and it's painful, mate, isn't it? It hurts. It's painful, but I yeah. wanted to keep coaching. I yeah. felt like I wanted to keep coaching. I never had an aspiration to coach England. You know, I, I was in Cape Town, loving life. You know, going to take the Stormers to wherever we could in the Super Rugby, and then I got the offer, and I thought, oh well, why not? And you know, since then, I've really enjoyed the challenge of of coaching England because it's. I think this job is not not a particularly easy job. No. You know, you don't get the players for long period of times. You've got such forces working uh, around the team. You've got high expectations, and and you've got a, a players with different set of skills than, than normally I catch. Yeah. So I've had to vary the philosophy of how we played, and that's why this this last little bit, this last two years, is so much fun because we need to change the way we play. We've got some good young players coming through that have got the, a bit of the bit between the teeth and we've got to play a more aggressive attacking game. Yeah, well mate, I've seen you make different changes throughout your time here. When, when you came in to the, to the gig after 15 World Cup, which was not the best for England, you had immediate impact in that next Six Nations. And then, I'll be honest, a lot of people would be say to me, oh, Beaver's gone to England, you know, and yeah, he'll get him up and then it'll phase out in yeah. a couple of years, he'll burn bridges yeah. or do something. I know you'll be better yeah. than most people from yeah. that point of view. And, you know, they all said, but six years now yeah. and, and six years coaching England is, is a successful feat in itself yeah. because it can be a very harsh environment, obviously. What's been the thing that you've been able to do? What have you been able to do that's been able to give you that longevity? And relatively continued success in the position since you've taken it on? Oh, I think uh, maybe just continually evolve, mate. Um, 
And I think the game's fascinating at the moment. Like, if you watch how the game continually changes, and it's just the nuances around the game that changes. You know, the game doesn't change, does it? You've got to get down the other end yep. of the field as quickly as you can to score points and stop them coming up your end. But just the little nuances and being able to try to try to keep ahead, uh, try to work out where the game's going and, and try to try to create a game style that suits our players, yeah. um, given their domestic rugby that they play, and then, then evolve that into a, a team that can play together. Because, you know, we have these guys for, for five days before we play a test match, so yeah. it's all, you, you've got to do it quickly. Yeah, I, I see you've had that league influence. You talk about the game evolving and the, the rugby league influence. I can see it's obviously pretty clear with Martin Gleeson, Anthony Seabold. You had um, Jason Riles yeah. who was prepared to come here. So it's obviously been something that has influenced you a lot. Um, and I see the way you set up your coaching team where you've got an attack and defence coach, a league, and then you've got two forwards coaches where the, the nuances of rugby are there. Is there a special way that you, you like to use the, the knowledge of rugby league that you have to try to influence your game with the English team here? Yeah, well, I think in terms of phase attack and defence now and unstructured attack and defence, we've got so much to learn from league, mm. so much to learn from league. So why wouldn't we use them? Yeah. You know, and I remember, you know, even when we played, we used to we used to watch the NRL and we'd want to copy how they attacked and then we brought that into our Randwick way. And it's funny, you know, if you look back now and you see how the game's evolving, that ability to play flat and fast now is a common term that everyone uses. Yeah. And that's how we were brought up to play the game, wasn't it? Flat and fast. That's right. And so the league guys understand that better than, than the current group of of rugby coaches now that'll change in the future but the league guys understand that and martin gleason uh and sees a bit you know got off to a really good start uh, that's good that's good i think um mate what i wanted to ask you about is some you you've participated in i think five world cups isn't it a cup with south africa with australia yeah. with england with japan you're coming to your fifth now and you seem to have a a cycle that you follow and it's this middle period now you did it last year last cycle as well where you started making changes is that is there a formula that you've got um, around World Cup cycles where you start to shake it up at a certain period of time or do you just identify okay this is an aging part of our squad we've got to make some changes here well I think you, you try to use all that data you know there's all the data about the average age and average number of caps um, but I reckon the big thing is, and, and it's different with each team, but I reckon each team's got about a three-year cycle, mm -hmm. about a three-year cycle, yeah. where if you're going to get them humming, you'll have them humming in their third year. And if you're not going to get them humming, you've probably got the wrong players. Um, so I always try to work in like four years, set a bit of a plan, two years refresh, which we're up to now. And, yeah. and this is a mucky period now, yeah. because sometimes you replace some of your good players with younger players who aren't quite as good, yeah. but they're gonna be better than them. Um, so you go through that, and if you can get through this little mucky period now, you put yourself in good stead for the World Cup. With that in mind, I feel like you've been the coach that's been able to really harness the talent that's in England, the, the, the amazing player talent resources that they have here, so many, so much depth, and you've really been able to to get some great players come through. Who who have been some of your 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 best deliveries from you know where you've seen a young player coming through to a player that's really killing it for England right now? Well, I think Marcus will be. I remember seeing him in 2015 World Cup. I went down. We were in Japan, we were down in Brighton, and someone said, come watch Brighton College play. So I went and watched him, and there was this young 10 that was like, it was like a, a Mark Eller. He was just fl uh, sliding around the field, picking holes, throwing passes, and, and then he played club rugby, and, you know, club rugby at that stage was going through a, a real kicking phase, you know, yeah. it was how much you could kick, so he sort of lost his way a little bit, and they ended up the end part of the club rugby in the previous season opened up a lot and he came into his own 
and he's going to be a fantastic young player. Has he been someone that you've identified from way back? Yeah, just been waiting for the right opportunity to bring him in. You know, sometimes you've got to pick the right yeah. time from the come in. Yeah, and there's a bit of a, like, I, I would sort of think about Matt Guido a little bit the same way. You've seen that player yeah. from a long way out and brought them through. Have you? Would that be something that you would be looking at all the time, different players that you might earmark and seeing when they might come into the team. So when you went to Brighton that day, could you have imagined Marcus playing or starting a test match like this one on Saturday um, in 2021? Well, you don't know the timing, but it's a bit like, you know, the World Cup's a bit like preparing for the Melbourne Cup. You know, you don't need to be at your best on on the Saturday before the World Cup, uh, before the Melbourne Cup. You know, you see sides, there's that... uh, 2400 metre race, McKinnon Stakes it might be, 2000 mm. metre. And you're always looking for the horse that's coming home hard at the end of that, that's to to ready for the World one. Cup and ready for the Melbourne Cup. And it's a bit like that for, for rugby. You're trying, to, you're trying to work out, right, where, when are they going to be at their best and how do you get them to their best? And, and, and that's the difficult bit dealing with the media because sometimes you can't talk about that and you get criticised for not picking a young guy earlier than you think you should because the one thing you can do mate is is you can ruin a young player by bringing him in too early without a doubt that's for sure i i was thinking about you you talk about the media oh i've been in paris for a couple of weeks before here i took my kids to euro disney just the other day so i went up and down on the space mountain a couple of times <laughs> which is the biggest roller coaster freaked me out all yeah. over and I'd say that, that's, I was thinking about it, it's probably the great analogy of your relationship with the media. Yeah. You know, it is a roller coaster. And I know I'm there, I've been yeah. there with you a couple of times and I've been on my own ride on a few yeah. times. Mate, is that, and you love it, I know, right? Is that how you like to play it? Is it, is the controversy or the, do you like to bring that sometimes? And, and, for any particular reason or is it just something you like playing with? Oh, look, I think sometimes it can advantage your team you know, yeah. and, and it's becoming less and less like that. Um, but I also think we've got a responsibility to, to promote the sport. Okay. Yeah, you know, I, I think we've got a real response. And if you don't say anything, you don't promote the sport. So you've got to be prepared to roll the dice a, a little bit. And the other thing is the, the media tries to bully us all the time. You know, they try to bully coaches into saying what they want. You know, they've, you know, th- they come into a press conference and they know what headline they want. Yeah. You know, so they've already got a, re- and they're trying to push you into that. Um, and I reckon the fun is trying to resist that. Yeah. And then you get a bit of angst, mate. That's right. Well, you will have seen it even in this week with, yeah. with the things that yeah. have happened around Marcus. Where do you think that though that can come back? I felt it myself on different occasions where I've, like, you rub against the grain, right, and then that same rub against the grain comes back to get you when you say something and then it's taken in, in a direction that you certainly didn't mean it for or intend it to. It just ends up where it comes back to bite you. Do you think that's just, it comes with the territory or it's something that you try and step around when it comes to dealing with the media? Yeah, I just think it's part of the job, mate. It's part of the job that you've got to accept. If, if you want to say something, you've got to accept that, particularly now, that someone's going to be offended by it. Yeah, you, know, you can say the most. I was thinking the other day. You know, I said to the to the press the other day. I said we don't want any Mexican waves, right? So now you could offend Mexicans by saying that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's how it's construed. So you got to be so careful what you say. But I think you've got to you've got to try to entertain and promote the game a little bit because we want rugby to be a global sport. Like I think after 2019 World Cup, they said there's nine million people follow rugby. But we want a hundred million or, or whatever it is. And yeah, we want to like, you know, we were, we've been lucky enough to have great lives by yeah. being involved and we want the sport to get better. So you gotta you gotta promote it a little bit. Mate, they've they've given you a fair bit of grief over here. I never really understand why, because you've gone pretty well with them considering since two fifteen. But that's how it happens, you're up against the grain. It's taken you to task a little bit about staff too. You know, it's hardcore and it, is that your is that a bit a bit of, and and that's a bit of I'd say in rugby circles yeah you know people love to hear third fourth hand yeah. fifth hand information yeah. and say oh yeah Eddie's hard on his people etc cetera, etc cetera. is that your 
Is that just your desire for standards or is that a, a, a way that you like to keep refreshing your team around you so that your players are hearing new information and getting next to new people all the time? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Firstly, mate, they've missed all the good stories. Yeah. <laughs> they always do. <laughs> but like, uh, you know, I've got a commitment to, to want to be the best and some people some people can, can meet that and some people can't. And, and if they can't, then, then you move on. Like, and the other thing, mate, I, I really believe in now. Like before, I reckon, probably when we played and, and maybe for two generations after that, players liked stability. And I think now they like change. Like mm. having, having Gleeson and Seabold come in with new ideas now, yeah. the whole place is lit up, mate, honestly, because the players want new things. Yeah. Mate, I love it because everything's happening quicker, yeah. right? And the evolution, there's no reason that says that coaching has to be the same as coaching yeah. always has been. Every other craft and, and job is changing as well. And, uh, you know, often those that make change are criticised heavily yeah. as well, you know. But uh, I think that that's really, that I've seen it from a coaching point of view myself, and that's really effective in bringing in change. And yeah. it hurts sometimes because you've yeah. got to let people yeah. go and yeah. you're not happy I've been there. Yeah. And I've been that person yeah. as well, you know. Yeah. So... Um, it's just really interesting to see how, from an outside point of view, it's almost, almost like they want everything to stay the same, but yeah. things have to change inside of the organisation. And I think the longer you've been in a job, mate, the more you've got to change the staff yep. underneath you, because whilst you can change the what you talk about, you're still the same person, and, and players want to hear new information, they want new things, and you know, the longer I coach, the more the age gap comes between the players and myself, so I need young staff coming in. Yeah, well, I felt when I've been confronted with that myself, I've always had that battle with loyalty. But where does yeah. that battle with loyalty sit for you? Uh, that? Well, I've, got, I've probably got a group of 10 or 12 coaches that I've been associated with mm. that are 100% loyal. And I'm 100% loyal to them. Like, there's three or four on the Wallaby staff that I'd do anything to help them. And they've done anything to help me. Uh, whereas other people, you, you just don't develop that with everyone, mate. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm loyal to the ones who are loyal to me, uh, 100%. So now I've got the camera. Uh, I figure it's my big chance to go and do... Uh my um, screen test yeah. for who wants to be a millionaire right. anchor, right? <laughs> Ed McGuire in, good, in Australia, I don't know who runs it over <laughs> here, but this is it. No, no, no. So the question, you're in the hot seat. The question is, uh, Eddie Jones, post-2023, will want to do A, coach an NRL team, B, Coach of Wallabies, C, coach of British Lions who tour the Wallabies, or D, none of the above. Just sit back, relax, maybe kissing your World Cup uh, <laughs> winner's medal, chilling out, having a, a pina colada. What do no, you think? I've got this dream, mate, that I'm going to catch in the West Indies 2020. So I'm looking for a team over there. <laughs> I've already decided Barbados is the place to go. Imagine doing that, mate. That would be good. I happen to know the guy who runs it. So That's if good, you mate. Need a so contact, we can I can get him straight in there. You are one of the great cricketers. You're looking forward to the Ashes coming up? Yeah, it should be fantastic, I mate. won't even ask who you're going for. Thanks, right, mate. Good Appreciate on you, mate. it. Good to see you, mate.